Praise. 
Lift your song to the Lord. Begin to open your mouth. Let's turn here into his gates with thanksgiving. Just courts with praise. Come on, let's do that. Right now, let's lift our voices to the Lord with thanksgiving, with praise for what he's done, for who he is, for all that he's promised, for all that he's done, all that he said. We thank you for your goodness, God. We thank you for your faithfulness. Oh, we thank you that your love is steadfast. That you never fail, you never change. We lift our voices to you tonight, God. I praise you. Thank you that you never fail. Even when we fail, God, even when we're unfaithful, you remain faithful, Lord. Thank you for the grace of Jesus Christ, for your precious blood that washes away all of our sins. We worship you tonight, God. We worship you, Lord. Just lift your voices to you. Thank you for 
for something. Thank you for his character. Thank you for his blood. If you've done it a million times today, thank him again. praise you. Just give him praise tonight. Give him worship. Thank you for your goodness, Lord. Thank you for your love. I was going to share something tonight to encourage y'all to enter into worship, but I feel like I don't even have to. Y'all just entering so beautifully and just I feel God's presence already. And Let's just continue to worship God. He's faithful. He's good and he's worthy. In Psalm 63 it says, because I've seen your, because your steadfast love, I'll lift my hands. I'll rejoice in your name. I'm paraphrasing, but now my soul will be satisfied as with marrow and fatness. Let's just continue to worship tonight and continue to let God be our satisfaction. Let him fill us tonight. Let him meet us. Let's just sing about his love and his faithfulness. As we sing, lift your voices and think about God. Think about who he is. Begin to declare with your mouth that, God, I thank you for your faithfulness, for your steadfast love. It doesn't have to be profound. Just declare to God who he is. Describe unto the Lord glory and praise. Yes. Thank you, God. Yes. Your love, oh Lord, reaches to the heavens. Your faithfulness, aren't you thankful for his faithfulness? Stretches to the sky. Thank you for your grace and your faithfulness, Lord. Your righteousness, your righteousness is like the mighty mountain. Yeah. Your justice flows like the ocean's tides. And again, your love, oh Lord, sing of your love. Lord. Reaches to the heaven, reaches to the heaven. Your faithfulness, so we declare your faithfulness, stretches to the sky. Oh, we declare your righteousness, Lord, you are above all. our voices to the King.
reaches to the heaven Your faithful Stretches to the sky As we play through that As you see it's so simple Let's begin to say something to the Lord Thank Him for His love and His faithfulness Oh we thank You that Your love is steadfast Lord, and it never fails Thank you, God, that you're the same yesterday, today, and forever. This again declare the Lord, his goodness, his faithfulness. It doesn't have to be profound. Just open your mouth, God. We thank you for your perfect love, Lord. We thank you that your mercies are new every morning, God. Your faithfulness and goodness, we praise you, Lord. that just a little bit more but I want to just give you this word while we're singing Romans 1 and I just will remind you of this a lot when they worship the creature more than the creator then they were handed over to a reprobate mind to a life of confusion to a life of immorality They called the things that were right wrong 
and the things that were wrong right. If anything in this nation is to be corrected, it will have to originate from the church, from the people of God, where God is in the place that He deserves to be. He will not be reduced to human terms. He will not allow Himself to accommodate man and man's opinions of God. He is unchanging. He is immutable. And the heavens worship Him. And when the humans don't worship Him, everything is broken. And the process by which that is fixed is for God to be worshipped. In the beauty of holiness, in the majesty of His being, in the mystery of His wisdom, that He does things we don't understand, but we trust Him and we say that He's right and He's good and He's just and He's holy. Oh, God. And in that, our minds are filled with the mind of Christ and our hearts are filled with light. And we're not in despair or depression. I just want us to sing this chorus out to the Lord again. And I want us to lift up our hands and lift up our voices and just sing it out as a declaration of worship to God this night. That you are holy God, God of wonders, God of creation. You are holy God. You are worthy God. Oh, we magnify the name of the Lord. Jehovah Yahweh, Elohim, Jesus.
for some of us, it's very easy to sing that. Some of us are living life right now. We're in a great moment. We're in a joyous season. But for others of us, life is real. And we're in the middle of it. And we're going through it. And it's hard. And we don't know what decision to make. And we don't know how we're going to get to the next day. And so you hear us, you see us, you know, jumping around, exuberant. Praise, 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 worship, worship, worship. But you can't. And you're like... I want to worship. I love it, in fact, but for whatever reason, I can't open my mouth. I can't let out worship. And it's hard for me to praise because I feel crushed. And how can I jump if I'm being crushed? But the good news for you is the definition of worship isn't simply coming up here and singing. It's giving God his breath back. It is making a sacrifice in obedience. And if you have something you're holding on to that you feel like it's the only thing you can see, you just surrender it, and that is worship. But then you're also asked to praise. And we think of praise, and we talk about it a lot as David, you know, being undignified in the streets, and that's awesome. But when Job was sitting on that ash heap, that was just as beautiful praise in the eyes of God as David dancing in the streets. Why? Because this man lost everything, but he went and he left it as sacrifice, so therefore it was worship. And then he sat on that ash heap, and he looked at the heavens, and his praise, I believe he barely could get a breath out. Imagine if you were in his place. But his praise was because he looked at the heavens and he said, yeah, this is my life and I don't understand. But you're good. I don't know why this is happening, but you're good. And it was the acknowledgement of God's grace and the repetition, Job speaking aloud, the promises of God that was praise. So whether you're up here and you're jumping with us in the choir of praise, or at your seat, or your bed, or in the altar, and you're breaking. All that you have to do is declare who Jesus is, and that is praise. If you look at the Lord, and you look in his eyes, and you look at the heavens, and you fix your eyes upon Jesus, it takes the problems, the focus off of your problems, and you say, God, you are a provider, you are a healer, be that. You said you would do this. I have faith that you will do that. And it may not turn out the way that you hope, but it will turn out to be the very best possible outcome for your life. Because he knows what you need better than we do. And your praise isn't walking around burdened, not knowing how you're gonna get from the next day and giving up. Your praise is walking around saying, yeah, I'm burdened, but it's not mine. So it's your problem now because you're the provider. So you see this in my life and all that I know is you're good. So praise from your ash heap or praise dancing in the streets, it's beautiful. And that's what God asks of you. And your worship is a sacrifice and it's obedience. And if there's a decision you have to make or if there's something you have to relinquish, that's all you have to do. You come to this altar and say, with your worship, sacrifice, that's what an altar is, your physical presence down here. And then you turn it into praise and you say, I'm worshiping, I'm here, I'm sacrificing my life here at this altar, I come here. Now I praise because you asked for this thing to surrender, and I don't know why, but I do know that you're good. And I do know that when you take it away, you're gonna give it back double, and you're gonna provide for what you remove. And that's what praise and worship is. And I'm thinking about the songs we sing, you know, Highlands. I praise you in the mountains, and I praise you in the valleys. Most of us probably spend more time in a valley than we do a mountain, right? Because life's hard. But the valley doesn't have to look like a mountain. We've determined those names. We've determined the definitions of what these things are. But if you're standing on Christ and your eyes are fixed upon Christ, you're standing on your mountain. Whether it's covered in shadows or it's at the beam of the sun, you're looking at Jesus and he is your mountain. And then the next song we sang, I don't remember what it was, what was it? Your love, O oh Lord. I was just thinking, I will find my strength in the shadow of your wings. It's a valley, you're in the shadow, right? But if you're standing on the name of Christ, he's your strength. And that's when you're worshiping, you're giving your obedience and you're giving your sacrifice. And then when you're standing in that shadow and you're standing on your valley and you're like, but you're good and you're true and you're worth this, that's your praise. And it can be loud and it can be fun or it can be broken, but that is your praise. He doesn't care, he just wants your eyes on him. And that is your affection and that is your praise. So I'm just thinking, as we sing these songs, as we move on tonight, join us. If you wanna come up here and you wanna dance and you wanna give everything to the Lord, that's beautiful. But if you need a bow in your seat, or you need a bow in the altar and you need to cry, that's beautiful. So 
So I want to invite you to join us in praise and worship, whatever it looks like in this season. And the other great thing is we're not aimed to do it alone. So if you need to tell anybody, like, the details are just, can you be with me? You don't even have to pray for me. Can you just stand next to me and let, my praise, let your praise carry mine? Amen. That's great. So can we do that? Can we just sing another song, whatever you want to sing? And can we just come and do that together? And, let, and let's do that right now. There are even some people in the altars, and you can just tell they're needing prayer tonight. So let's just move out of our seats and pray for one another. And there might be people in their seats, and you just know there's a need in their life. Just go to them and just begin to pray. and Bind the enemy. Take authority over the enemy from people's lives. Shout grace to the mountain that's in front of you. Just shout grace, because it's by the power of the Spirit of the Lord that these mountains move. And if you're in Christ, you're in freedom. You're more than a conqueror. You've already won. Receive that victory from the Lord in the name of Jesus tonight. Just claim it from Him. This is a beautiful picture of praise. Even even now, just praying for one another. Just serving one another. Father, we thank you for your presence. God, we thank you that in your presence there is grace and there is rest. Thank you, Lord, that in you is victory and freedom and wisdom and power and glory. And you are our way maker. You are everything to us. 
There is no hopelessness with Jesus. There is no helpless cause. Not with you, Lord. You are our great hope and our great reward, and we are prisoners of hope. Isn't that wonderful? The people of God are prisoners of hope. Some people are in prison to misery and despair and addiction. But the people of God are prisoners of hope. Wow. Thank you, Lord. I want us to pray, if we can, for just a moment for Daryl Turner. We were in Mobile yesterday. His conferences began last night. We had a service this morning. They're in service right now. And, um, and then they'll conclude tomorrow night. And so can we just pray? I'm telling you, Daryl is on fire. He, is, he's, he, he gets up there. He's like a, he says of himself, he's a buffalo, the personality of a buffalo. And it's true. But he gets up there and says, now I'm not a prophet, but he's prophesying. It's powerful. Just lift him up, if you will, right now. People have come from all over the United States to be in that meeting. Father, we thank you for your anointing on Daryl. We thank you for the power of your word and the power of the Holy Spirit, God, to accomplish everything that you want to do in this hour. God, that the church would be the demonstration of your manifold wisdom in the earth and to principalities and powers in the heavens, God. Lord, that you would be exalted, God. Father, that not only would Daryl speak the word of God, but by the power of the Spirit he would speak. And Lord, by the anointing of the Spirit of God, people would hear tonight what you're saying to their life, God, in the name of Jesus. Change everyone. Enlarge everyone. Awaken people, God. The church is so deeply asleep in this hour, God. Oh, Father, I pray, stir us, Lord, for your coming is at hand. Dear God, thank you. Thank you for Daryl. Thank you so much, God, what you put in his heart. And thank you for his friendship and leadership in this hour, God. Oh, we love him. We just pray for Gwen, God, and that you strengthen them. Thank you so much, God, in Jesus' name. Amen. I, I have to talk to you for a few minutes tonight. Jordan was asking me, she sent me a text, is this going to be like a normal service, or is this going to be one of those hybrid services where we stay up there for two hours while you just have a minute to share something? I said, it's going to probably be that latter part. Um, I appreciate Evan Powell ministering at the 9 o'clock service Sunday. Very, very good. Tremendous word. Felix, Sunday at 1030. Andrew preached on the Wednesday night. Just beautiful ministry. I just appreciate them so much. Just very quickly, I want to remind all of you that this Saturday is our leadership breakfast. We will meet next door. It starts at 9 o'clock. It's an extremely important meeting, and so I just want to encourage all of you that have received a notification to come. If you do serve, because some people have not received a notification, and they are definitely leaders in the church, um, please make sure that we know you haven't received that, because for some strange reason, you didn't get it. And it's not that we don't want you there, Okay, so we just want to have that feedback. If you're at all wondering, should I go? Then go. All right, it's not an exclusive meeting. It is for our leaders, but I think the information is worth everybody in the church hearing. Um, so you're all welcome to come. That's at 9 o'clock Saturday. And then if you will remember Sunday, this Sunday night at 6 o'clock, we're having a very special service. Ushers can come and receive our offering while I'm doing this, if y'all will. And I want to thank y'all so much for your giving. It's so, it's so needed, it's so special, and I appreciate every one of you doing that. And so the ushers, if you would, you can just come and <clears throat> begin to go around and receive the offering now. Thank you so much. Um, but I wanted to say Sunday night at 6 o'clock, we're having a special service. It's an ordination service. We are going to ordain Andrew, um, Evan, and Joe. Uh, and so, Amen. <laughs> The three of them are also being installed as pastors here, 
And so we'll explain more of that Sunday night. But guys, this is holy and it's spiritual and it's respectful and it's extremely important. I know I'm, pre- I'm talking to a Wednesday night group, right? But if there's anybody watching live stream and this is your church, we ask that all of you be here Sunday at six o'clock because it is holy. It is very special. It is heavenly. And your participation as the body of Christ is extremely important. And I believe you will be glad you come Sunday night to this ordination service. And so I just want to thank you for doing that. And then coming up very shortly, February the 9th, we're going to have our next Wednesday night eating, meeting, fellowship meeting. I don't know what you call it, but next door. Amen. I'm glad you enjoyed it. Everybody seemed to really have a wonderful time when we did it in January. So we're going to do it again February the 9th. And I just want to encourage you all, the doors will open up at 630 And so you just come, food will begin to be served at that time, and we'll have some fellowship, have a word of devotion, and have worship, and I just want to thank you for coming. I want you to turn in your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 6, and I want to read a scripture to you tonight, and I want to talk about this for just a few moments. And this, this is the heart. I may talk about this for the next couple of weeks, and the title of this message is Work the Altar. Work the altar. There are things in the Bible that admonish us to work, to labor. And um, and so it seems like, you know, so many people want to shy away from work. But if ever there needed to be the work of God's people, it should be in the altar where people are meeting with God. Now, let me tell you something, and I think this is extremely important for you to know. If there is a moment in any church service that God is really looking forward to, I would say to you that God's special moment is not when the worship team starts singing and not when the preacher starts preaching, but it's when everything that has been done has been done with a specific intent that God wants to have a meeting with you in the service. And whenever that is, if it's in the altar during the singing or if it's in the altar at the end of a service, that is God's excitement that you are responding to him. And that's what God loves. And I pray that you will understand, as we have taught this year already, how important the altar is. I don't know all of your backgrounds. I don't know where you come from. But I'm going to tell you something. There is something special about Pentecost. And there's something living about Pentecost. And I believe that we need to really celebrate what God the Holy Ghost has brought into the world and brought into the church. Over the years, the decades, the millenniums, it has been not uncommon to see denominations hijack very important things that God wanted to be fresh and full of life in his church. And one of those things was the altar. The altar has been here since the book of Genesis when men and women would meet with God. As I've taught you before, the altar is not the place necessarily. It can serve as that. But the primary purpose of the altar is not for backsliders to get right with God. And it's not for sinners to come to the front of the church to be saved. The altar primarily is the place where men and women of God would meet with the Lord. And they would worship God in that altar. And oftentimes you might hear us say, just make an altar where you are. And that's, if you're doing that, that's totally appropriate. But if you would be honest and look at the average church and the average church service, even when it comes to the end of the service, and let's say all of the music and the praying and the preaching has been done with an emphasis to somehow bring you into the presence of God So that God might be able to speak to you and minister to you. That moment is the most important. And yet in that moment, if you would be honest and even look around in, in most churches, you would find very little people are responding. Very little people are doing anything. There might be a handful of people that actually go down to the altar to worship God and to pray when it should be the most visited. Somebody says, well, I go to the altar all the time. You should. 
It should be our habit to go there rather than sit there where we are. And if you would just look around in an average church service, the people that don't go to the altar, watch them. And it's not all, but a lot of people that don't go down there are just simply looking around and observing. And so they don't make the altar where they are. What God wants to sow into their heart and into their spirit is oftentimes lost by the time they get to their car. After they fellowship with some Christians and became easily distracted by events that are going to happen that day. For example, maybe it's a football game and you think, you know, Joe Burrow's going to pull it out this time. And now all your mind's focused on that. And it was like, I don't even remember what the Holy Spirit said to me in church. And so we come to the altar because the seed can be planted in our heart. And so it's important to come to the altar. But tonight I want to focus upon, and I'm, I'm grateful to bring this to a Wednesday night crowd. Because really you're the workers, you're the soldiers. You're the ones that are going to take these things seriously and you're going to labor them. And how many of you want to see a move of God in our city that will make a profound impact. And let me tell you something, guys. Baton Rouge is a dangerous city. It is one of the top murder capitals, human trafficking, drug trafficking cities in the United States of America. And we've got churches everywhere. All right? So going to church certainly isn't the answer. And just being able to preach truth just isn't the answer. There needs to be an overflowing and an outpouring of the Holy Spirit where the demonstration of God is occurring and it brings such a fundamental change in the life of the church that when people leave, the community changes because changed people are going out there. <clears throat> and it takes something more than just somebody going to an altar. There must be those who work the altar. Those who work the altar. And I am appealing to you tonight to sign up, not on a piece of paper in the foyer, not through an electronic registration system at the church website, but as a volunteer to the Holy Ghost, I want to be one of your workers. I want to commit to this. And if people drop out, I want to go through it to the very end or until Jesus comes back. I want to join with you, Holy Ghost, in those altars. And I want you to be able to move through my life to bring people into freedom or to other places that you have for them to go while they're seeking you in that altar. And that's another beautiful thing about people who come to the altars because it's identified there that somebody's really meaning business with God. <clears throat> and there's an attention that is drawn to them. And it's not bad. It might be a little bit uncomfortable because you think people are all watching you. And they're really not. But they might notice that you're down there. And it draws attention to other people who are full of the Holy Ghost that begin to intercede for you. And that is one of the greatest blessings I believe that we can have in the body of Christ is to have people who are full of the Holy Spirit interceding for me. <clears throat> and so I want to encourage you tonight to work the altar. I understand that all of you in this room may not do that. I would to God that all of you in this room would. I would to God that you would have freedom in the Spirit, and you would not be confined by the restrictions of your flesh to really begin to seek the Lord and that we might truly have a Pentecostal experience in Baton Rouge. And it has to begin somewhere. And I pray that it will be here. And so I want you to read this with me in Ephesians 6, verse 10. <clears throat> and we're told this, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Now he's telling us to be that because... That's the gifts that are given to you. You are given the gift of power through the Holy Spirit. You are given strength by the grace of God. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles or the strategies of the devil. All of his various tactics. God has given you armor 
that is able to cause every strategy and tactic of the enemy to be unsuccessful. And I pray that we get this. Please get this. And he says in verse 12, far we wrestle. He doesn't say that in past tense. He says that in present tense, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, and against spiritual wickedness in high places. <clears throat> and so there's a wrestling that is going on. We wrestle. We're talking about the church. We wrestle. I don't know if you do, but if you're the church of Jesus Christ, you should be, because if there's power anywhere in the world, it has to be in those believers who are spirit-filled, and if the strength of God is to be seen anywhere in the world, it should be in those who are spirit-filled, and so therefore, those who are spirit-filled, you need to be wrestling. You need to be contending against something. And then he gives us a list of what those things are. And there's spiritual wickedness. And there are rulers and there are principalities. And it speaks of authorities that are carnal and natural in the earth. But it also speaks of authorities and principalities that are spiritual in their domain which oftentimes finds their effectiveness through carnal rulers. It could be a government. It could be a governor. It could be a mayor. It could be a city council. It could be a school board team. And we are to wrestle against that with strength and power, with the armor of God, because we can overcome it. You don't sing it away. And you don't make a positive confession and it goes away. When I understand the context of wrestling, it means that I must engage myself with the enemy and I must, in Jesus' name, defeat him. And I'm given strength and power to be able to do that. And we have the privilege of exercising that, all right? So I want you to see it. One of the translations says this. It says, we used to live in the ways of this world. Or I'm sorry, let me, let me come back to this. In, in chapter 6, he says, For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers of this darkness, against evil, spiritual forces in the heavens. So we wrestle. Now li listen to me. I don't believe there's a person that has entered this sanctuary tonight that has not in some way had to deal with Satan and his kingdom this week. Everybody that has entered into this sanctuary has had to contend with him, like it or not. He is an adversary. The Bible also refers to him as a lion, if you will and ferocious, and he, there's no backup in him, there's no give up in him, he has to be made to leave. And so you've had to deal with him, whether you know it or not, you've had to deal with him. And when we come into the church and into the sanctuary of God, it ought to be such an atmosphere and such an environment where the body of Christ has come together that through the power of the Holy Spirit, through a real Pentecostal meeting of believers, those devils and that attack and those strategies that have been set against us become null and void in the presence of God through the warfare of God's people. But oftentimes we don't fight like that and oftentimes we don't go to church with that mentality. We go to church hoping and wishing that maybe my life's going to be touched and maybe I'll give it, be given an hour of relief and then I'll get back in my car and I'll go back to my home and I'll go back to the job tomorrow where there's all kinds of trouble I've got to deal with. Why not overcome that trouble in an altar tonight? Why not receive victory from Jesus Christ so when you go back to work or your home tonight, something has changed. Something has been pulled down. Something has been defeated. 
in Jesus' name. And you need help doing it. That's why God gives you a body. That's why he gives you a church. That's why he calls us to intercede and come alongside of one another to fight hell against another. Why do you think the Bible says one shall chase a thousand and two shall put 10,000 to flight? So get, amen. So I'd say to you, get over your pride and get over your arrogance and get over your shyness and express the conflicts that you are in with some Christians that are around you because for God's sake, if one can chase a thousand and two can chase 10,000, imagine how many three and four could chase away from your life. You begin to battle and war and believe God, and that's working the altar. And I'm calling upon you to be soldiers. I am. I'm calling upon you not to be fickle. I don't want to have to stand up in this pulpit every service and give you a reminder of this and say, would y'all please help fight for one another? I pray you will do this on your own because the Holy Ghost is in you. Sometimes you're going to need that intercession, and even when you need that intercession, it still doesn't mean you can't intercede for somebody else. <clears throat> and so we fight these battles and these principalities. We wrestle not with one another, but we wrestle against these principalities. It is a fight. It is a close fight. Wrestling denotes hand-to-hand -hand combat. It is in your direct vicinity, <clears throat> and you are dealing with this. There's not a person in this room, born again, filled with the Holy Spirit, that's not experienced some form of temptation in your life this week, today. There's not a person in this room who's not been enticed to do something ungodly. Those are strategies of Satan against your life, and you are in a fight, and it's good to have people fight with you. It is a blessing. Now what this might signify, referring to Ephesians chapter 2, if you'll look there, what this might signify, these battles that we're in, <clears throat> would give us a little bit more clarity as to the struggle. For he says in verse 2, in time past you walked according to the course of this world or the way of the world. It's not too hard to see the way of the world today. And according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now works in the children of disobedience, and that word disobedience means unbelief. <clears throat> now listen, that's how we used to live, and we don't live there anymore. We as Christians have been given armor that we can put on that is able to overwhelm and overcome all of the attacks and the strategy of the enemy. We have been delivered from this power. We have been set free from this power. And we are no longer under its domain or under its authority. We have been translated into the kingdom of God's Son, Jesus Christ, and we are the children of light and the children of life. But that does not mean that these powers do not array themselves against you on any given day with a desire or an effort to take you down. And there's a difference between Ephesians chapter 2 and Ephesians chapter 6. Because in Ephesians chapter 2, when you were dead in your trespasses and sins, you didn't wrestle against these things. These things ruled your life, and they overpowered your life. And Jesus Christ has now come and rescued your life and given you power in the Holy Spirit. So you have moved into Ephesians chapter 6, where now you can actually fight back against these powers. And these powers fear the God that has given you authority and who lives in you. And we can be extremely successful. And I pray that you will understand that. And so I come back to chapter 6 and I just say this to you. We wrestle. 
Come on now. We wrestle. And my question is this, when I was reading this passage, is there anyone who still wrestles today? I mean, really, is there anyone who still wrestles today in Holy Ghost power? Because Holy Ghost power is effective. Holy Ghost power destroys the enemy. When I think about what the young people in this culture are inundated with, and how practically young couples today are really at a loss. How do I even begin to engage my young children and protect them from what is going on in the world today? There seems to be a loss in that when parents really need to be wrestling, not with their children, but with the cosmic powers and principalities that have strategies to destroy their life. And mom and dad, you have been granted power by God to successfully wrestle against that darkness and stop it. And if parents won't do it, they're in a church that'll do it. And we must do it. We must work the altar. And this is what my heart is tonight for us. It is important that we come to the altar. It is important that we pray in the altar. It is important that we worship in the altar. It is important that we have a place where we're worshiping God and praying and seeking the Lord. And people can identify us and they can come around us and they can pray for I don't know how many times standing in the altar, I'll have somebody lay their hands on me. I don't even know who they are most of the time praying over me and praying for the service that day. And I receive strength from that. And I know God is doing things in that. And I appreciate so much the prayers of God's people. So we're to fight principalities and powers. When people come down into this altar, they're coming down here to talk to God. They're coming down here to do business with God. They're coming down here to worship the Lord. They're coming down here to surrender to a call. They're coming down here to believe for a deliverance, for a victory over an addiction, for forgiveness, for restoration in their life with God. And I promise you every devil in hell will do everything they can possibly do to stop them from getting there. And Pentecostal people need to intervene and stop the devil. We need to work the altar. We do not have the right to be passive. We do not have the right to sit back. We do not have the right to be spectators. We're fighting for the ones that we love. We don't have to be intrusive. Somebody can come into the altar. I don't have to invade them. I don't have to be intrusive to them. I don't need to get right up in their face and begin to pray and talk and all of this right in their face. I don't have to do that. I don't have to grab them by the shoulders and tell me, what are you down here for? What are your problems? What's your sin? What are you surrender? I don't have to do that. But in the name of Jesus Christ, I can take authority over everything that would rise up against them and the knowledge of Christ in their life. And I don't even have to touch them. I can just stand behind them and plead the blood of Jesus over them and overwhelm those powers that would try to keep them from the anointing that God wants to give them in their life. And don't you want to see everybody anointed? And if the kids don't want to come in the altar with the culture they're fighting at it, go to them. There's no rope there that says no old people pass this line. And if your parents aren't walking with God, you go over there to them and pray over them in the name of Jesus. Don't wait for somebody to motivate you. Be the soldiers of Christ as a young child. Make a decision who you're going to follow. You're going to follow God. You're going to follow other youth. You're going to get excited about Jesus or want to be accepted among your peers. Well, I say forget the peers and follow God. He's the only friend that will never leave you or forsake you. He's the only one. This is not a time to play around. This is a time for soldiers and the end of the world is here. It's time to mean business with God. And so I just encourage you to do it. And when people come to the altars, I just ask you this. Work the altar. Help the people for God's sake. 
Stand with them. Stand behind them. Protect them. Plead the blood of Jesus over them. People coming to the altars can be very vulnerable. They're letting their guards down to God, and God is meeting with them. And you can come behind them, and you can be a fence around their life. And you can be a protection to their life. Philemon chapter 1. I've referred to this a lot. You're going to hear this scripture maybe over the next couple of weeks a lot. But in Philemon 1, and I want you to read this, it's extremely important. Paul says in verse 5 regarding Philemon, hearing of your love, and this is right before the book of Hebrews, hearing of your love and faith which you have toward the Lord Jesus and toward all saints, that the communication or the giving or the fellowship or the exchange of your faith may become effectual. How many of you have prayed, God, I want to have mighty faith? Come on. Three, four people? Come on. How many of you? Acknowledge it. Confess it. You have not because you ask not. Let's say it again. How many of you have prayed, God, I want to have great faith? Come on. Praise God. Don't you want that? And so he says that the communication of your faith may become effectual or effective or powerful. How is it going to become powerful? By communicating it. By giving. Stop talking about what you say God can do. And begin to get up and believe him to do it. Because when you communicate that faith, it becomes effective. Because you're doing something in faith that God can do. So that the communication may be effectual. How? By the acknowledging, the confession, the recognition of every good thing which is in you in Christ Jesus. What good things are in Jesus Christ? Everything. And is there any limit to him? Any limit of wisdom? Any limit of healing? Any limit of authority? Any limit of power? Any limit of mercy? Any limit of grace? Any limit of love? No! And so Paul's not saying to Philemon, begin to acknowledge how good you are or what a good Christian you are. No, it's got nothing to do with you. But it's acknowledging if Jesus Christ does indeed live in you, then acknowledge the good things of Christ that are in you. And if Jesus is in me and there's no limit of his goodness in me, then all power and all authority and all ability now through Christ resides in me. There's nothing that's too hard for us. There's nothing that's impossible to us through him who strengthens us. But you will never know that if you don't acknowledge that. And it's not uncommon for people to say, well, the preacher's got that. The apostles got that. The missionaries got that. The Sunday school teachers got that. But, man, I, I'm just me. This is, this is, well, it's not about you. It doesn't say acknowledge you. It says acknowledge who is in you. And if you acknowledge who is in you, you don't have to be a Smith Wigglesworth. You don't have to be a George Whitfield. You don't have to be a B.H. Clendenin or or a David Wilkerson or a Leonard Ravenhill. My God, Jesus is in you. And when you acknowledge that and you begin to communicate that faith, it is going to become very effective. And you're going to have an incredibly exciting Christian life. And it won't be boring and dull by sitting around Saying and believing, God can do anything, but you never see God do anything because you never communicate the faith that God has given you. You begin to communicate it, you will begin to see it. And so he says, we have great joy and consolation in your love because the bowels of the saints are refreshed 
by you, brother. So Philemon did it. Philemon's exercising of faith resulted in great joy and comfort through his love to the Apostle Paul and to other saints as well. Gave them great joy in that. And so I just want to conclude with just a few things tonight. And I want, to, I want to say to you that altar workers demonstrate, I would say, three things. They demonstrate, first of all, faith. If you don't have faith, you're not going to be working in an altar. You're going to be scared to approach it. You're going to be scared that you don't have the means to provide an answer to people that might be dealing with some real issues in their life. And when you have, listen to me, when you have no faith to get into an altar and work, to work for other believers, to fight for them, to believe for them, if you can't exercise your faith in the house of God among the children of God, you will never demonstrate your faith at school or at work or in the marketplace. And when we begin to exercise our faith in the house of God, in the altars, where people are going to respond to God, and we can get into that altar and we can work that partnership with the Holy Ghost to be able to fight back hell and wrestle against principalities and powers, and to cast down everything that exalts itself against the knowledge of Jesus Christ, so that every thought can be ca brought captive to him, and our brothers and sisters can go on into their anointing, go on into their calling, go on and hear God, because they need to hear God. They don't need to be fighting the devil. I'll fight the devil for you. You talk to God. You have the faith to believe that. And if you have the faith to believe that, if you have the faith to believe that Jesus actually lives in me, and he is capable of answering everything and doing anything that I am faced with, then I'm not afraid to go into any altar and meet with anybody. Because Christ can meet it. And I believe that. And I, I don't have to make an excuse as to anything that happens. I'm just going in faith to exercise what I believe God wants me to do. The second thing that you'll find in altar workers is love. Faith and love. You know, the Bible tells us that Jesus was moved with compassion. Jesus would see people in need, and he could not sit back and watch. He couldn't. Jesus was moved by his love to begin to involve himself in another person's pain and in another person's heartache because the Spirit of the Lord had anointed him to heal the brokenhearted and to set at liberty the bruised. And so he couldn't sit back and watch the pain and the suffering of other people. He would enter into it and he would love them. And I believe it is very, very difficult for people who love God and love one another to sit there and watch a person responding to God and do nothing. Love is going to compel you. I must help them. And it's going to move you to action. And the third thing you'll find in an altar worker is the confidence to do warfare. The Bible says that Jesus came to destroy the works of the devil. The works of the devil are many. Depression, despair, worry, unbelief, addiction, abuse, molestation, lies, and the list goes on and on and on as far as you could take it. And Jesus Christ came into the world to destroy those works of the devil. And the anointed one, Jesus Christ, lives in you. And you know that for those dear, beloved people in that altar, 
that are responding to God, maybe they're going to be raised up as one of the great revivalists of our hour. Maybe they're going to be moved out of an addiction in their life and they're going to step into freedom. Maybe worry is going to be broken over their life. Maybe loneliness is going to end for them today. And I am going to step into their life and I'm going to do warfare. And I am going to pray and believe that the, that the strategies and the work of the devil is destroyed in their life today. And I'm going to take authority and I'm going to bind the enemy for whatever I bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And whatever I loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. And I'm going to go and I'm going to fight for my brothers and sisters. I'm going to go stand around them. I might stand behind them. I don't have to invade them. I don't have to enter into a space. They need some privacy. I'm just going to go and I'm going to stand by. I'm just going to praise God. You are the Lamb of God who has overcome. I thank you, Jesus, that by your blood our sins are forgiven. I thank you that you've restored all things. God, if you were looking for perfect people, how could anybody in the world ever serve you? You only had one perfect son. And I thank you for the anointing. And I'm just going to stand behind them and begin to praise God and God's going to move upon their life and they're going to have a visitation of God. I just believe that. Maybe God will give me a word to speak to them. Maybe I'll have a word of knowledge. Maybe the gift of the Spirit will begin to work through my life. Maybe I'll have a discernment of somebody that's attacking them and I'll begin to take authority over that person or that situation in their life. Maybe I'll begin to pray for them and I'll understand their boss is attacking them and I'll begin to pray, oh God, change their boss's heart and let them begin to have favor, and all of a sudden they light up, and they say, how did you know? That's happened to me when I've been praying for people in an altar. You're just praying over something, and all of a sudden you're praying in the Holy Ghost, and you're praying about something specifically in their life that they're going through, and the victory's there. It's so exciting. It's just so exciting. I'd rather be working an altar than sitting in a pew. It's two-minute warning, guys. God put me in the game. Because that's what it's down to. And, I, and, and so people who work the altar are people who have faith that Jesus is going to do it. They have love because I, I'm going to help you in every possible way that I can. And I'm going to fight for you. I'm going to fight the devil so you can have peace in that altar. And hear and talk to God. And I'm going to believe for God. And I'm going to stand around you. And I'm going to praise Him. And I'm going to worship the Lord. And God will give you discernment. Because sometimes the Holy Spirit will say, You know what? I just need you to stop talking right now. Because I have something to say to Him. And you're distracting Him. Yes, Lord. And you're just quiet. The Lord shows you. You're not doing this alone. You're not doing this for God. You're doing it with God. And He does it. And so I just... Pray that you understand it because a Pentecostal ministry, you know, I, I would say this, I, I've, I think a lot of denominational preachers, a lot of non-Pentecostal denominational preachers, they, they come and they get a message and it's very clever, it's very good, it's very clever, they hope you get a hold of it, they hope that you will listen to it, they hope you'll understand it and you'll go do something with it to change your life. But that's not Pentecostal preachers. When Pentecostal preachers preach, we preach and we hope and we pray and we believe that God the Holy Ghost is going to get a hold of you. And he's going to do something with you. Because you dare to enter into his house. And he's going to send his word out and he's going to get a hold of you. And you'll never be the same again. You'll be more mad than when you came in or you'll be more glad. But you will not stay the same. And Pentecostal people, come on. You go to most Pentecostal churches today and you'd say, I'd rather be in a Baptist church. This thing is so dead. And you know why they're dead? Because the people are dead. And I don't want a dead church. I want us to be a living church. I want you to be filled with the Holy Ghost. I want you to be in love with God. I want the fire of the Holy Ghost to be all over your life. I want you to believe God and walk with God because that is an important aspect of a Pentecostal ministry. 
It's not just that the preacher preaches that way and believes the Holy Ghost to get you, but there are spirit-filled believers all over the room that are going to pray in the Holy Ghost and pray in tongues and do war against the devil, and miracles are going to happen, and people are going to be set free, and they're going to go back into the community and say, I, I don't know where I was, but I've never been in a place like that in my life, and God was there, and God set me free, and people at work say, I got to go with you next week. I got to go there. I, I've got to be there with God. I need God to touch my life. And it's the people. The queen of Sheba went to see Solomon. You know what took her breath away? His people. His people. The way your servants approached the temple. It took my breath away. You are so valuable. And I, I beseech you, put your warfare clothes on. Put on the whole armor of God and begin to work the altar. You don't have to invade a person's life or privacy. But you can aggressively fight the devil from what he's trying to do with their life. I want you to stand with me, please. I didn't preach two hours. It's not even 8.30. But I want to ask you, would you please join me in this altar tonight? And would you pray that the Holy Ghost would get a hold of you? I want you to lift up your voice. I want you to lift up your hands. I want you to pray. I want you to pray that God, I am in partnership with you. That Jesus Christ lives in me. And I'm excited. Come on, you pray this. I'm excited about being your servant. I'm excited about what Jesus can do through my life. I'm excited about the people that are going to be set free. I'm excited about the ministries that are going to be birthed. I'm excited about the ministers that you're going to call. God, I'm, I want to serve you, God. I, I count me in. Count me in to work the altar, God. Count me in to fight for you, to fight for people. Count me in, God. I want to love. I want to believe, God. Give me great faith, God, in the name of Jesus. Give me great faith. Come on, pray. Pray. Give yourself to God. Give yourself to God. Give our church to God. Give our church to God. Oh, let the Lord have it. It's time, beloved, to tear down strongholds. It's time to stand against principalities and powers. It's time for parents and grandparents to tell the devil, you're not having my kids. Social media is not having my kids. Facebook, Twitter, they're not having my kids. I will not let them go. I will not turn them over. Oh, God. Oh, God, help us. God, stir something up in this moment, God, in the name of Jesus. Come on, pray in your tongues. Pray in the Holy Ghost. Continue to just let that river flow in the name of Jesus. We are an army. We are an army anointed. Oh, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Be strong. Hallelujah. Be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Put on the whole armor of God. And fight. Fight. For God's sake, fight. Wrestle. Wrestle. You're not going to lose. You're not going to lose. You win.
Except for a heart singing hallelujah, hallelujah. I just want you to listen to me for a second. Everybody listen to me. I believe that the Lord has just asked for a moment of silence, just peace before you just played on the instruments. I believe he's going to speak to some of you. We've talked, we've praised, we've shouted, but just play it on the instruments and we're just going to take a moment. We're just going to be still before God. Amen. Don't move. Don't move from where you are. Just sit before the Lord. Just accept that this morning, tonight. Just accept it of the Lord. Thank you, Lord. God, we love you. God, we love you. God, we love you. Oh, Lord. Just pray right now. and Just pray, God, don't let the enemy take this from me. Don't let the enemy take this from me. Sow this into my life. I long to serve you, God. I long to serve you in the body. I long to help your people, God. I long to be clothed in your power and in your might, God, for your service. Don't let it be taken from me. Don't let me forget this. Don't let me need a preacher to remind me. God, let it be who I am. Let me be a person of faith and love and warfare. Come on, let's sing it a little bit more. Hallelujah. Your name is a light that the shadows can't deny. Your name will not be overcome. Your name is a light forever lifted high. Your name.
something to you tonight as, as we come to this point. I by no means am commissioning you. 
Jesus already has. You're his servants. You're his ambassadors. Go into all the world and teach all men the things that I've taught you. Make disciples of all men. He gave us authority over devils, over sickness, over disease. He gave us authority. So, beloved, I just tell you that what I'm talking about is not confined to function within a church building. But this truth is as powerful on the streets, in the marketplace, in the schools as it is anywhere else. You need not make any excuse for God. We're not doing witchcraft. We're not going out. I'm picking this up or I feel this about you or I feel that. No, the prophet of the Lord knows. You speak. You see a person in need. You see a person ailing. You see a person sick. You go in the name of Jesus and say, somebody living in me is able to heal you. Can I pray for you? It is not for you to make an excuse. It is for you to believe. And then the rest is up to God. The rest is up to God. Let him have his way. But you go and believe the Lord. Men are in Ephesians 2. Bound by the God of this world. You've been set free. You are the only one that can wrestle with that power. And it's really not much of a wrestling match when you're in the Holy Ghost. It's done. It's exciting. And I just encourage you to this exciting life. Jesus has already sent you, so go. Go in the power of his might. Go in the strength of the Lord. Go in faith and believe God. And don't keep Jesus in. It's time to let him out on our streets. It's time to let him out. It's time just for people to believe the Lord. I love you. I bless you in the name of Jesus. Thank you so much for being here. And I just thank God that I get to walk with Jesus with you. You're a beautiful church. Love you. God bless you.